This is the first video in a series on protein needs and disease states. It covers some basics of protein metabolism, the RDA, and recommendations for older adults. If you want to understand the protein needs in various disease states, then you first need to understand some basics of protein metabolism in the body. For this, there's no better place to start than the amino acid pool, which consists of all of the free amino acids that are available for the body to use. It's not confined to a specific organ or location. Instead, it's distributed throughout the body and found inside of cells, in the extracellular fluid of tissues, and in the blood plasma. In total, there are three sources that supply it and three sources that deplete it. For the sources that supply it, we have the amino acids from the protein we eat, digest, and absorb, which we can call our dietary sources. Then we have the non-essential amino acids that are synthesized by cells, and we have the amino acids that are conserved after protein breakdown, which occurs to replace proteins that are worn out or damaged. Many of the amino acids from the old protein get recycled. For the sources that deplete it, we have the greatest amount going to protein synthesis, which runs counter to protein breakdown by creating new ones. Then we have amino acids going to the production of nitrogen-containing molecules like neurotransmitters, DNA and RNA, nitric oxide, creatine, and heme. Last but not least, we have amino acids that are used as substrate for energy production, gluconeogenesis, and or ketogenesis. Collectively, protein breakdown and protein synthesis are components of protein turnover. This is a continuous process that occurs at different rates for different proteins in different cells and tissues throughout the body. Usually when we talk about it, it's in the context of skeletal muscle, since that's the largest reservoir, accounting for approximately 50% of all of the amino acids that are stored. However, protein turnover also constitutes the proteins that make up the bone, skin, nails and connective tissue, the vital organs, enzymes and hormones, and the proteins that participate in the transport and storage of other nutrients, acid-base balance, and fluid and electrolyte balance. Finally, protein turnover is influenced by a number of factors. Factors that stimulate protein synthesis include the intake of dietary protein, especially the branched-chain amino acid leucine due to its role in activating the specialized enzyme mTOR, hormones like insulin, insulin-like growth factor 1, and growth hormone, and physical activity, specifically resistance training, because engaging in it lowers the threshold for protein synthesis to begin. We can call these the anabolic factors. Factors that stimulate protein breakdown include the hormone glucagon in response to fasting, starvation, or metabolic stress, stress hormones like cortisol, epinephrine, or norepinephrine, pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukins 1 and 6, and muscle disuse. We can call these the catabolic factors. Under normal circumstances, assuming adequate total energy intake, the balance of protein breakdown and protein synthesis is controlled, and we're able to offset any losses from the amino acid pool with our normal intake of protein from food. This allows us to maintain muscle mass, keep hair, skin, and nails intact, and preserve all of the other functions of body proteins. If intake consistently exceeds losses, then the balance of protein turnover can shift in favor of protein synthesis. This makes it possible for there to be a net gain of body protein. But if losses consistently exceed intake, then the balance of protein turnover is shifted toward protein breakdown to replenish the amino acid pool. 
This will result in a net loss of body protein, leading to an overall decline in functionality, with consequences like the loss of skeletal muscle and a decreased ability to fight off infection. The current recommendation for adults to achieve net protein balance is 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. This number comes from the National Academy of Medicine, which sets the Dietary Reference Intakes, or DRI, that the United States government uses to provide intake recommendations to the public. 0.8 is the Recommended Dietary Allowance, or RDA, meaning it's supposed to satisfy the demand of 97.5% of the population. Nevertheless, it's based on laboratory studies of healthy subjects only, with healthy being loosely defined as the absence of disease. Thus, it's only meant to be applied to individuals who match this description. When people develop acute or chronic illness, the need for protein can change drastically. This is typically due to an increase in catabolic factors, a decreased ability to tap into anabolic factors, an increased demand for amino acids to be used as substrate, or some combination of all three. So, in many disease states, we see a tremendous slowing down of protein synthesis and an acceleration of protein breakdown, pushing the balance of protein turnover decisively in favor of protein breakdown and decreased functionality. Later in this series, we're going to explore medical conditions like critical illness, cirrhosis, chronic kidney disease, and pressure injuries. But before we do that, I wanted to cover a population that makes up the largest percentage of hospitalized patients. I'm talking about older adults, which we can define as adults ages 65 and above. Even though this population is covered under the RDA of 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, there's a growing consensus in the clinical nutrition community that this isn't enough. The most formal challenge to the RDA for older adults has come from the PROT-AGE study group. This group of researchers was brought together by the European Geriatric Medicine Society in July 2012, but it consisted of subject matter experts from all around the world. They reviewed the available data on protein needs for older adults and came to the conclusion that the most appropriate recommendation is 1.0 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. They also recommended an intake of at least 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal using any combination of foods that provide at least 2.5 to 2.8 grams of leucine. The study group does mention how protein needs can be increased in the setting of acute or chronic disease, so they provided a general recommendation for 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day, while noting that critical illness and kidney disease are possible exceptions, with the former sometimes requiring more protein and the latter sometimes requiring less protein. Overall, the daily recommendations are consistent with those published by the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism in 2014, which is the only major nutrition organization that I've seen take an official stance on this matter. The reasons older adults need more protein include the following. 1. They have a decreased ability to participate in protein synthesis, a phenomenon that's often called anabolic resistance. Simply put, to get the same anabolic response from a meal, an older adult will need to consume more protein than a younger adult. 2. There appears to be a reduced postprandial availability of amino acids. This is partly due to increased splanchic extraction, which means the gut and liver in older adults use up a greater amount of amino acids before they ever enter circulation. 3. There's an age-related decline in insulin sensitivity, and we saw previously how insulin is one of the anabolic factors. 4. There's a decreased capacity to engage in resistance training, which we also saw as an anabolic factor. 
And five, even without significant disease states, older adults can have chronic low-grade inflammation that stimulates protein breakdown and inhibits protein synthesis. Once again, we have the RDA at 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, and just above it we have older adults at 1.0 to 1.2. In the next video, we'll start filling in these question marks by exploring cirrhosis and chronic kidney disease. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and I hope you'll consider buying me coffee by using the thanks function right here on YouTube.